And if all has gone according to plan, you should see um, my slide in front of you. I'm quite proud of how I can use Teams presentation now. <clears throat> Let's hope it stays there. Um, so for those of you joining us for the first time or, or are pretty new to WIT, welcome and obviously welcome to all of our long-standing WITers. For those of you who um, recall, July is our anniversary month and we are six years old. So WIT South Africa was introduced in um, July 2015 and we're still going strong. So welcome and uh, thank you to all of you who keep showing up. We've got over 200 ladies in our database um, and as as we, as we they can attend or they follow the recording afterwards. So very, very cool and um, lovely to have you all here. Um, just a little FYI, what is the Women in Tech Network? Just so that you all know, it's, you do not have to be a techie to be part of the Women in Tech Network. Nowadays, everybody is a woman in tech because no matter what industry or you're in or what job you do, you're using technology to do it. Um, but what we are trying to establish is a community where we can interact, network, share information, learn from each other, and provide support for entrepreneurs and young women getting into the industry as well as other businesses. So very, very cool to have so many different people here um, and, and different industries and, and different organizations represented. And this is where we want to get you all together to network. Um, we've got our three focus areas. So we focus a lot on self-development through networking and knowledge sharing enabling the next generation of young women to get into this industry in any sphere. So whether it's specifically software development or <clears throat> if it's um, technology adjacent industries. And as I just mentioned right now, I'm in HR and I need to be a little bit technology um, adept. And in fact, my HR um, partner in crime, Loretta, and I are embarking on our Power BI training from um, next month, August. Um, so technology is for everyone. And then leadership development. And this is where we really want to share ideas. What are you guys doing in your organization for leadership development? How do we empower the next generation? How do we empower more women? What do you and, and let's share not let's share information and experience it. So this is who we are and what we do. And what I would love for you to do is to please join us um our LinkedIn uh, network group and our or our Facebook group, depending where you are, with the recent um <clears throat> um kickoff of Poppy. I really want to move away from email as a form of communication. Um, uh, it, it's it's difficult managing that, so it would be much easier if you were all part of our uh, LinkedIn or Facebook network. So please join us there um, and invite other people to join, invite other um, ladies to connect and that type of thing. And if you want to be a speaker, thank you. Loads of you who signed up for today, put your hands up for speaking. I'm really excited about that. Um, we're, and we're looking for loads of different ideas. It does not have to be technology centric. Um, we're looking for um, information that all of you will benefit from. So thank you for the enthusiasm. Um, and in the beginning of this year, Karika, who is my um, co wit Network Administrator, she put her hand up. Did you put your hand up or did I put your hand up? Um, oh, Karika, sorry, I haven't updated. <laughs> I've got the wrong picture here. Taryn is not Karika. Karika is on the other slide, still waiting. Sorry, Karika, so I'll update this. But Karika is a long WIT member. How long? Very long. I want to say more than four years at least. And um, she is so passionate about um, teaching other women to become more adept with the technology we use every day. So Karika is going to be doing our Tech 101 chat and then followed by Galen. So um, about two weeks ago, Galen published an article on LinkedIn, which was really insightful and had a lot of interaction around the future of work. 
And I asked her if she would like to elaborate on that topic um, in a wit session. And fortunately, she was game. And here we are today. So Galen will be then following up from Karika. Um, and before we kick off with the speakers, Tracy asked me to share a little community FYI. Um, if you are in the um, M365 space, then this is particularly information for you. Uh, some great community uh, learnings here, and you're welcome to share this information with your organization. So without further ado, Karika, I'm going to call you up, please. Let me stop my presentation. Oh, there we go. Stop presenting. There's, that's the actual Karika, not Taryn. Sorry, Taryn. Um, Karik, welcome, and over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, yeah, so I'm just, uh, I wanted to keep today quite short and sweet, um, so let's get to it. Um, um, I wanted to share with you guys, um, you know, almost to say we're all so familiar with using Google every day, but I don't think a lot of us have ever taken the time to really delve deeper, you know, into what, you know, there is to offer. And again, what's nice about Google is that mostly all of these uh, functionality we get for free. Um, so if you would like to um, connect with me on LinkedIn, my LinkedIn uh, URL is at the bottom, or you can just use the hashtag TechSmartWorkRika and we can start um, some interesting conversations regarding tech. Um, so the first one that I would like to start with is um, the Google search. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but for example, you can, in the Google search bar, you can, you know, ask it to do some math for you. You can put in, you know, like if you want to do a subtract or, um, you know, multiplication, um, you can just enter the, um, the numbers and it will do the math for you. Um, great for school children, but maybe you don't want to tell them this is it. Um, there's an option to do exchange conversions, you know, especially these days, you know, dealing with a lot of overseas markets, you know, you want to convert US dollar to um, South African rand or vice versa. And it also gives you that nice little graph to say, you know, how it's been going the past few months, for example. Um, you can ask for the weather, um, you know, and even what I found especially useful, you know, within the tech space is when I want to troubleshoot issues. What I would do, for example, if I want to search, as Lauren mentioned, that they're learning Power BI, there's a, there might be a, many other resources that you're not, how can I say, 100% confident that they're giving you the right information and you want to check only the Microsoft docs. Then you could type in, for example, BI and then um, site to the colon and Microsoft.com. What will then come back will be only the Microsoft site um, options about that. Um, we can make this a nice interactive one if you guys want to maybe try any of these ones in your own Google browser. Um, you know, you can see, you know, what other type of information might be available. Um, also very useful is, for example, if you want to include or exclude certain words from the Google search. Um, here I've got an example where we want to search for Mustangs as in probably the um, horses and not the cars. And if you just um, put a uh, hyphen with the cars behind it, then, you know, it will already filter your results to only what you want. Um, another great feature um, from Google is Google Forms. Um, you might all be very familiar with Microsoft Forms or SurveyMonkey. Um, I think we've all had them in the workplace these past year and a half with COVID. Um, however, this is something that you could use for your own um, resources as well. I just quickly want to show you guys. So if you click, for example, um, if you click, this will be your main navigation when you click on this, I just want to say array of dots, and you get a, a wide variety of applications to, at your disposal. And one of those are my, um, Google Forms. And as you can see here from the template gallery, they give you some options to try off, but of course you can create your own ones from scratch. Um, whether you want to find the time, you know, with various people, you know, send a kid's invite, um, teaser, uh, sign up events for work for event, order form, job application, um, you know, very similar to what the other offerings are, 
And again, if the template that you want does not exist, you can create your own. Also very useful for teachers, um, but again, any application really. Then one of my absolute favorites is the Google Calendar. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware that you can actually share these calendars um, on your profile with other users, for example. Um, you can see I've got an example um, where I've got my calendar and the dog's calendar. So you can be quite surprised that a dog has so much um, that you know, I need to keep track of. It's almost easier for me to do it within a calendar. Uh, for example, I track these annual vaccinations. Every three months, he needs to get a deworming tablet. And of course, you know, just to remind me to just give his coat a nice brush, I've added a, a small meeting um, appointment in my calendar for that. This is, um, you know, because I don't own the dog on my own, it's my husband's as well. I've shared the calendar with him and we can share the tasks of having to remind each other, you know, that certain task needs to happen. For example, like a deworming or a three month, um, you know, the flea and ticks for, from the vector that happens every three months. And the nice thing with this is just a, like you have a recurring meeting um, at work, um, you can set these um, either annual or monthly or every three month recurring um, appointments for, um, in my case, my dog. But you might have kids that have soccer practice and they inquire and, you know, maybe you need to pick them up and your parents uh, might need to drop them, the grandparents might to drop them off. And this is a great way to keep everybody on the same page. And this, of course, they can all view on their cell phones if you've integrated like that. Sorry, there seems to be a bit of a delay when moving slides. Um, Google Drive is another such a great um, offering from um, Google that we get. And again, if you think of it, how you use um, files and folders in the works, uh, um, work scenario, you know, how you would also be able to use that in your personal life. For example, if you uh, um, are looking to, to apply for jobs and, you know, we're no longer walking around with your CV, you know, in a nice folder and you just hand people, you know, like a stack of papers, you, we're doing it um, within your Google Drive, you could possibly share the link um, with a future employer. Um, or um, you can, you know, share it directly from your Google Drive and then um, send it as an email um, onto an HR department. Um, in this screenshot particular, um, when I started with Lauren on the WIT network, we, you know, it was quite a thing to say, get the new logos for the WIT network um, to, a you know, to a group that wanted to host an event because then they wanted the black version and then they wanted to know rather have a colorful version of it. And it became a back and forth of sending emails. Doing it in this manner, we put it in a public folder where we prevent people from um, making changes to it, but they still have access to download a copy of the logos. And this way, you know, it's easy just to share it with future uh, people without having the risk of people changing the items. Um, another place where this could also be quite useful um, is when I was like very when I was active with uh, um, the hockey uh, associations where we had a bunch of league rules that we needed to share with people, but we didn't want them to change it. Um, although my, you know, with my um, other committee members, they wanted to um, have access, for example, to be able to make certain changes to it, and that way we I can share edit rights with them but not with other people to make sure that nobody goes and changes the rules, for example. And again, like I mentioned, know how you do things at the workplace. And then if you want something similar, you know, then you can apply it with your, um, in your own life as well. Um, maybe something like a will, something that you would like to share with other people, um, you know, that they also have access to information um, if required. Um, so this is a firm favorite of mine, um, is the Google Maps and the My Maps. Um, everybody, I'm quite sure, is very familiar with Google Maps. 
And, um, you know, the biggest the advantage that I feel uh, of that is the fact that you can, it will give you a calculation of how far you are, for example, from either your home or work location, and it takes traffic um, into um, account as well. Um, the other great thing is printing a map and directions. Even within this um, digital world we live in, there is still sometimes a, a very um, basic need to get directions on a piece of paper. And I'd just like to quickly show you some of that. Oh, sorry, I can actually have showed you some of these items. For example, with the sharing of the logo, you can share it with specific people or groups and then whether they're allowed to edit it or not. The calendar settings um, that are, where I mentioned that you could share it maybe with grandparents or other people that need to know that your kids' activities, um, you can set certain details on it, make it public or share it just with specific people. Um, and also, you know, who's allowed to change those type of settings. Um, just to come back again to the Google Maps one that I wanted to show you is that you can have the various, um, you know, you would set out your route where you would choose um, whether you're going from Gold Roof City to Marlborough Station or it's maybe switch it around and say we're going from the station um, to the theme park. It will tell you, for example, the distance. And um, one thing that I did when I, um, when I was first aider at my um, company uh, was to print the um, directions from our offices to our closest hospital. Because you never know in the emergency, you know, does everybody know where is the closest hospital? Um, and just to make that simpler, is uh, something that I put in our first aid box, which whoever needs to attend to the emergency can just take that paper and immediately know where to go to that um, to the closest hospital. So, for example, with this, you can maybe add additional information here, like the telephone number of the hospital. And then if you scroll down here at the bottom, you will see... Three, sorry, you. I don't know if you know that we can only see your slide. Oh, sorry. That should not be the case. Let me reshare that again. Thanks, Laurie. There we go. Thanks. My apologies. Um, I'm just going to go one back again. So sorry, yeah. So this is where you could switch around whether you're going or coming from a certain um, uh, point. Um, and then when you click on it and you want to then go and, for example, print these directions. So you print it, including the maps. You can put in the telephone number here at the top or any other information. Um, as my example, you know, with the hospital, for example, and this will then give you the um, directions on how to get to a particular place. Um, as mentioned, yeah, very, very useful in emergencies uh, if not everybody's aware where a hospital, for example, is. Um, the other feature that I quite, um, you know, thoroughly enjoy as well is my maps from Google. Um, as you know, or as you can see at the bottom here, it also uses the Google My um, Google Map interface. In it. And with the My Maps, you create your own layers on top of the existing map. In this case, to um, stay with Gold Roof City, I have mapped out two out of the, of the central restaurants that we've got in this area. And let's, for example, say that we want to map this two rides here at the top. So I've got activities here at the top. And I'm just going to draw a shape around it. Um, I previously assisted um, someone who is a committee member at a, a townhouse complex. And, um, you know, they needed to look at each of the different uh, um, apartments or houses, you know, in the complex. And they used this tool to, for example, to map out each um, house uh, where they're able then to add photos. So let's quickly just update this with rides. Example, just going to save this. And let's say, let's add some photos to say, um, that how does the anaconda look, for example? You can, of course, take um, photos that you've got from your um, phone or um, Collected elsewhere. Sorry. 
just move it like that. So when we save it, so you can add like additional information and it will map out that area for you. Um, you can imagine if you've got more areas, for example, if we only want to see the restaurants, we can disable the activities or we can add it back in. Um, there's lots of cha um, changes that you can do. Um, I don't know, um, you know, the possibilities are endless with this one, um, whether you need to, um, yeah, I almost was now thinking of a different scenario, but um, yeah, but, um, you can share this with other people, um, you know, and again, it depends so much on what you want to use it for. Um, I've not been able to use this in the workplace, but as I've mentioned, you know, for private um, or other um, scenarios, it has been quite useful, especially with, um, you know, where you need to share areas or aerial views with other people. Uh, just to confirm, you guys can see my screen again. Ah, last slide. Let me just go quickly go through this last one then. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, just to uh, view all the other items, when you click on these three dots and you scroll to the bottom to more from Google, you get a whole list of other items that you know that's available. You know together with your Google um, profile. Um, and I would really recommend that you maybe go through this list and see if there's anything that piques your interest. And um, I would like to make a special mention for the Google um, Arts and Culture one, where this is really a, a great way to learn more about absolutely everything, whether it's areas in South Africa, uh, the Drakensberg, um, history of um, South Africa, or famous paintings you know, from Europe. Um, there's a whole array of items and you can spend hours within that. Um, and I almost want to say, if nothing of this um, really interested you, um, you can always do fun things like these Easter eggs <laughs> that you do find every now and again in Google. Um, you know, just to make, yeah, <laughs> bring back some lighthearted fun <laughs> into the tech world. Um, so, yeah. Which one is your favorite? Um, would like to hear more from you guys. And yeah, if you can just maybe leave some comments um, and just use that he uh, hashtag text more to Farika. That was very cool, Therese. Thank you. I, I flipping didn't we? <laughs> now I understand why Google is so big because it's not just Gmail. So um, that was very cool. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions for you. I see Vanessa made a comment there um, for you. <clears throat> Lisa made a comment about uh, not knowing about drawing the shapes on Google, Google Maps. That's very, very cool. So, yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, and I agree with Natasha. I'm definitely going to go and investigate the arts and culture. No, I must say, I, I've lost hours in there. <laughs> but, um... I learned so much stuff, um, so much more about things that I would normally not, um, you know, yeah, learn. Uh, you know, and it's very nicely curated. So I would definitely recommend that. That's fantastic. Awesome. Any questions for Karika while you have her undivided attention? Otherwise, you're welcome to pop them in the chat um, and she can answer you individually. Everybody good? Thanks, Karik. That was very, very cool. Now we're all going to use um, uh, uh, Google much, much better than just uh, simple Google searches and uh, a few things like that. So thank you very much. And next up we have Galen. Ready, steady, and go. Cool. Thanks, Lou. Um, you know, last night I had. Can you hear me? Last yes. night I had. I had a dream and in the dream it was five to seven in the evening and I had just woken up and I realized that I had missed the whole wit session <laughs> which made me a little bit unsettled because I had promised that I would come along and contribute something and then what I realized is that the night last night before I went to bed I was reading a book by Susan David 
Um, it's called emotional agility, and I think uh, Lauren actually suggested it to me. And my that, favorites, love it. I haven't finished it yet, but I realized that in the book, just to trace a little bit of a process for you, she talks about showing up, which is kind of learning that emotional literacy, learning to name your emotions and be aware of them. And then she talks about stepping out, which is that helicopter view. So you pull back a little bit so you can observe yourself from afar and create some distance and pause in your thinking. And then she talks about walking your why, which is really this, um, which is aligning back to what matters to you in life. So what you find valuable, or some people call it your values, and making decisions based on that. And then finally, to get unstuck, it's shifting into that moving on piece. And it's not these huge groundbreaking, we're going to move to Bali and live on the beach and write a book, although that sounds extremely tempting right now. Um, it's about the small little actions, changes to mindsets, behaviors, etc. that produce this ripple effect in your life. But throughout all of the stuff that she's writing about, she's got this concept of like really being present and, and, and being in the moment and taking the opportunity to 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 value that moment that you're in and giving all that you can. So it's not ruminating too much about the past and it's not being too anxious or concerned about the future, but really just showing up in all that you have. And I realized actually that that was part of what my dream was telling me. And what my dream was telling me is not to be asleep in this session and to be more awake in this session. And what I mean by that is offering up like like all the richness of this moment and all that I can do in this moment. And part of that wasn't having like hundreds of slides, then I can go through some theories about the future of work, which is about making it personal and helping us all to connect with some of these concepts, which is really about a conversation instead of me sitting here telling you about the latest research on skills, etc. So what I've done is I've put together a few more slides, a few slides, less than I would have done before. Um, and it's really about using this connection point because connection is not only good for well-being and bonding, wellness. It's also good when things feel outside of our control. And I think this is why these kinds of sessions are so important and also sessions like this that you run with friends or in your organizations. It's because of that uh, sense of wellness that we get when we just connect and when we chat. Okay. So with that little intro, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and give you a couple of concepts. So for those of you who know me, um, I do work with leaders, teams and organizations, and I've had the privilege of working with teams before COVID and in through COVID and also with leaders before and during this long tunnel that we seem to be in. And it's given me some perspective on stuff that's working well and leaders and teams that are really showing up and shining up um, and also some that are not doing so super well. And I'm going to draw on some of those insights and also the stuff that I'm going to present to you on these couple of slides is some of the material that I've used in working with those teams. And that's also what uh, Lauren was talking about in terms of the blog that I'd written and posted um, the skills that we need for the future. So uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, okay, and put that on present. Uh, am I in slideshow mode? Yes. Yes, cool. Okay. Um, so just a couple of concepts. Um, before I get there, just to hold your thought on this, and this is, will be part of our conversation afterwards. When I think about the future of work, I think the future of work is about this relationship between work and between home, right? So if you think about hybridity and the hybrid workplace, some people are remote, some people are in office when there's not severe lockdown, and then there's a mix of the two. So some people are dialing in into this hybrid model that we're working in. It is about home and it's about office, right? Home and work. And there is a physical home and work to those things. Um, so physical place, but there's also another implication, and that's the commitments that you have at home and the commitments that you have at work. And then there's also this idea of the commitments that you have to yourself that exist at home and that exist at work. 
And what we're seeing a lot more of these days is a kind of interleaving of those two things. So this whole purpose, orientation, values, living your whole complete self, it's kind of interleaving those things. So I want you to hold in your mind that question about how these things come together. And we'll talk about it at the end. And I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts to flesh out that thinking. So the first is about hybridity and hybrid models. So part remote, part office, and a mix of the two. And what's, a, what's really at play here? So what we know is that there's a power differential that gets set up in hybrid working models. So the access that you have and the visibility that you have impacts the work that you can do. So access means, you know, do you uh, have the right tools and technologies for your work, laptops, um, access to a reliable power supply, which has become a real issue for us in South Africa, access to a reliable internet connection, um, access to an office where you can work or a desk or a space where you don't have um, other people who are in that space so that you can do your best work. So this is access. And that will dictate what kind of a work input you have or what kind of work you can do and how much you can achieve. So that creates a power differential. And it is a concept of visibility. And if you think about people maybe in your organization who've got comorbidities um, or at high risk for COVID, who have not been into the office at all. Some, some people have joined teams where they've hardly ever met team members. So people, when they're working completely remote, are less visible naturally than people who have a chance to come into the office. So this is important because you might get picked for a project because you saw that person yesterday. Or you might have a chance to praise someone or reward them, um, you know, verbally just to chat um, and give them feedback on something. So the visibility diminishes, um, could potentially diminish. Or if you have ac access through good tech, your visibility could increase because you might have access to more leaders in the organization through tech, which you didn't have. So it's the first concept that I want to in your head is that there's power differentials that exist, which means that we need to think about quite clearly about what does power differentials mean for ourselves and also for our employees. Then we've got these other three concepts, which I love. Um, it's drag, distraction and drama. So drag are the kind of practices that maybe are a bit outdated. If you can think of doing like a Mario Kondo on your, on your work, like, are there meetings that are not necessary anymore? Are there, um, Law was talking about this email culture. Like, what are the practices that you need to shed in order to make way for some new models of the future? That's your drag. Um, the second one is distraction. I think we all know about this. Um, it's impossible to multitask. You know, you can kick the dog and stir the pot at the same time. I'm not advocating anybody kicks any dogs. But you can do those things together, but you can't do cognitive work. You cannot focus on two tasks that require cognitive input at the same time. And you'll be constantly distracted um, by notifications, by emails, by having open door policies. Um, and the uh, there is a guy called Cal Newport. If you don't know him, look him up. He's done some great work, written a couple of books, done some podcasts. And he talks about um, hiring off periods of time where you can just focus on one activity. And what this helps to do is bring us into a flow state where we give up our best work and we actually get more productive. So I speak to a lot of people just loading up PC, getting on calls at half seven in the morning. They're, they're coming out at half seven at night and they feel like they're not doing any work. And it's something to do with this deep work and carving out time. So think about that from how you walk the talk and how you lead. Um, as well as what it means for your employees and the and your team members and the culture you create for deep work. Is it okay to have time where you're focusing on work if it's half an hour, 45 minutes? Um, the third one is drama. This is such a human thing, drama. Um, and it refers to uh, the kind of the drama that we create in, in workplaces because we aim to please uh, other people. Um, and it kind of manifests in things like being uh, overly present, presenteeism, um, and it also slows down our work and gets in the way of our best work. So these kinds of concepts lead us to these kinds of questions. So what is your hybridity configuration? So is there a policy for it? Um, who's expected in the office and who's not? Under what circumstances? For what meetings? Um, when it is, a, wh And what's expected between the lines? So it might be the policy to do one thing, but if people are showing up at the office more often, is that, does that turn out 
to be better for them in terms of the power differential. How visible are your employees? Where is your drag, distraction, and drama? And in terms of preparing for the future, what experiments are you want, running? What are the small things that you are doing? Um, just on this next slide very quickly, experiments allow us to engage with the future because we're trying out small things and some will fail and some won't fail. Um, but what we're doing is we're building up resilience and we're also stacking up those small achievements. So it's a way of feeling like we're more in control. Um, and then this last little chestnut, what hybridity competence do we need to build? So these are the skills. If you look at some of the latest research, it says tech skills lay a very good foundation and they will be in high demand, especially certain sets of tech skills. But the social skills that pack on top of those will be in higher demand in the future. And I think I've traced a little bit of an idea of why the social landscape is getting more complex because we've got to manage these kinds of things. So what kind of competence do we need to build? What we do know is relationships are key. We need to be better at forming, nurturing, feeding relationships in these kind of remote hybrid times. That's going to be critical. That hand in the middle of the slide there re refers to psychological safety. Psychological safety is, is going mainstream um, and also giving employees a voice. So some people in the organization, maybe this is you, maybe it's not, may not have the confidence, capability, or just the positioning to speak up and ask for what they need. So we have a responsibility to help those people to do that. So after I've spoken all of these things at you, I want you to take you back to that original question that I asked you. And if we think about home and work, and we think about the future of work as being a relation between those two things, how can we ask some of these questions from our home context as well? You know, how's it going in your, in your hybrid house? <laughs> Where's your drag or your distraction? Uh, what are the experiments you're running that are working? And what competence do you need to build to integrate these two? And we'll open that floor up for some some questions in a second. I just want to leave you with a couple of things. I also wrote a post a few months ago, but it's still relevant, and I called it Meta, Lessons from an Unknowable Yo. And it's just kind of things that struck me that we need to be thinking and maybe thinking more about, and it's these things. Like we, we went into a big lockdown, and uh, I remember the gym got closed, and I kind of like my gym. And I was standing outside in the sun in queues for hours and then I got in and then I couldn't, you know, there was all these issues. And I just remember I wasn't very human to the poor people on the reception desk at Virgin Active. And I think just remembering to be human in every action, interaction is super important. Um, operating above or below the line, above the line is curious, exploratory, collaborative, below the line is angry, defensive, uh, apathetic. We all bounce up and down these two. But it's just having the emotional literacy to say, where am I? And having the space to express where you are. Um, and then asking beautiful questions. There's a guy called Warren Berger. He teaches us to ask more beautiful questions because we need to question. Because if we don't question in this environment, we're not going to get the new solutions that we need for the future. Um, our resources are finite. And I see this with people and leaders and companies that burn burning out. Our resources of our planet are also finite. So make time, time out really, really sacred. And then when you have time out, get out. Get outside, walk on the ground, put your feet on the grass. Remember the natural rhythms of life and that life exists beyond tech in, in, in your home office. Um, investing in the bonds of loyalty and trust that people form with each other, that's called social capital. So connection points like this and other connection points. And investing and finding out where people want to make an impact, that's the people data piece, because we, we need this for the future. And in the last one, which is actually one of my favorites, is like do random acts of kindness, because these effects are really exponential. So it doesn't matter what scale you can do these on. I travel with a pocket of oranges in my car so that I can hand them out to people at traffic lights. It's just these small things that that make a difference, calling people, checking in, doing stuff for other people. It's, it makes the world go round. And lastly, if you don't know Margaret Heffern and look up her work, she's a tech entrepreneur. She just says, because we don't know the future doesn't mean we're helpless. It can feel like we're in this long tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel is a bit unclear. And then just when we see a bit more of a light, another wave of COVID comes and the tunnel gets a bit longer. <laughs> um, 
but just because we don't know the future doesn't mean we can't predict it. We can convey kind of now collective human imagination and empathy to imagine the ways forward. And on that note, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. And I'm going to bring us back to that question. I know I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. You see, you see, I said I would shorten it and then I just crammed more into quicker time. <laughs> no, I tried not to do that. Um, but talk, let, let's open the conversation up a little bit and have that connection point in that conversation. What, what do you think about the future of work being this relationship between work and home? And how's it been going for you? And what experiments are you running? And what is working for you? And yeah, who's... Um, Let's explore that a bit. I'll watch for, uh, we'll have a look on the chat. And also, Galen, I'm happy to start with the comments that you made me think about <clears throat> the hybridity approach at home. I've actually never thought about it until this very moment of how my home life has had to change as well to adapt to this, this world we're in. Mm. And what does that mean? What does it mean? Um, to be working from home full time and the space that we're in um, and the people around us um, and, um, you know, homeschooling and things like that. And uh, yeah, I don't have an answer right now because I'm just kind of being caught unawares going, you know, we've kind of just assumed it was just work that had to change, no more going to the office. But nobody up until now had ever been prepared to spend this amount of time in your own home. Mm. It's very, very insightful. Somebody's got their hand up, so let's start. And Yvonne. Um, yeah, I think the interesting one for me is um, being working from home, trust becomes more important. And building trust means you have to talk about yourself, talk about relationships. But you're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything. So there's really nothing to talk about. Like, <laughs> even with Paul at night, he's like, so. And I'm like, so. Like, I, I think I'm struggling with that a little bit because you're so restricted and everything you would have spoken about has sort of died. So there's nothing really to talk about. So I think that's the one I'm really struggling with is how do you carry on with this connection? How do you carry on building trust? How do you carry on interacting people remotely? But you don't really have anything much to say because like, there's not much from the day before. Um, and this is saying a lot considering Yvonne is married to the most extroverted yeah. extrovert in the world. So I think that's the one that I don't really have an answer for because some days like I really don't like people like you're quiet. It's like I really don't have anything to add because yesterday was the same as today, which was the same <laughs> as the day before. Like it's a little bit gray now. So it does make it hard to make the gray pretty and pink. Um, mm. I, I do struggle with that a little bit, and I, I don't have have an answer for that. So if anyone has ideas, it would be fantastic. But yeah, I think that's one for me that I, I think a lot about. Mm. And Yvonne, I'm just, uh, I don't, obviously don't have the answers either, but just if you look at your drag, distraction and drama at home, uh, maybe there's some answers in that, you know, maybe maybe there's some stuff that distracts and some stuff that's just drama or drag and some of the old needs to go out and some new needs to come in. But I like that idea of the hybrid at home. So maybe we've gotten stuck in a routine because you're not going anywhere. We haven't exactly adapted at home. So I like that idea and it's to review that. So thank mm. you. That was very insightful. Mm, awesome. Very, very good. Um, Ivan, yeah, yeah, what can you review? And, and, what are you doing at home? Same old, same old that could be changed, you know? So I'm already thinking, um, I know Sue's with me with this, like Margarita Fridays, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think that's a very valid point is to apply those drag, distraction, drama um, points to home. Like, <laughs> and sorry, Molly, so, I'm not getting a chicken. I can see you wrote get a pet, but I ain't getting a chicken. I'm not that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that extreme yet. <laughs> next, uh, next hand up is Nikki. Yes, if you it can, is. It's, if you're decent and you don't have curlers in your hair, can you please put your camera on? I'm on leave, so I'm at home on the couch. Okay, Hello, good. Everybody. Um. Yeah, I uh, firstly, Yvonne, I can relate. 
Um, I phone my, I try and phone my mom. She's on leave. Uh, she's retired, so she's home alone, and she's got comorbidities, so she doesn't go anywhere. And we phone and we say, "Hi, hi. <laughs> so how's it going? Um, exactly yeah, I made on. potatoes for supper. Oh, about the meal that she's cooked. Like I, I, I cooked a meal. Okay." <laughs> So I, I really hear what you're saying and also don't have any answers. Um, find that we've been nostalgic and tell stories from the old days. But um, it, it is a real challenge. You're not actually doing anything new or, um, yeah. The only thing you really have to discuss relates back to what Galen's saying around drama as in what's happening in your house. But I do have a funny story to tell you guys about distraction. So it's something I struggle with and not with social media pop-ups and that kind of thing. But during office hours, there's so many things going on and everything's urgent. And I'm, I find it quite difficult to plan my day out. And I'm very good at mapping my calendar out. My calendar's always got time booked in it. So while I'm on leave this week, I sign up for a course called Four Keys to Indistractable Focus. And it was yesterday. It's by a guy near Aylin. I don't know, Aylin. I don't, I've never heard of him before, but I decided to do this course. And firstly, I'd prepared some Moroccan meat the night before and I had to get it in the pot to make lunch. So I start the course about not being distracted, completely distracted while I finish up cooking. <laughs> and then the one thing that can distract you more than anything else is when you look up and your dog's in the dining room going, mm, 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 <laughs> and you run. <laughs> so distraction isn't just during work and it's not just those, mm. um, it, it's not just social media and that kind of thing. It's it's dealing with home life and the geezer and there's no water yeah. or whatever else is happening. Um, but one of the key things I did take away from this course of indistractable is about mapping out and planning time to get work done. So they call it making time for traction. And uh, it's about booking time in your calendar so that you've got time to reflect, that you've got time to map out what you need to do in the week and I think it's something I naturally did very well before the time, but I, I found it very useful when it was reinforced in this in this class to to actually book out your calendar. But what I found most interesting was he said, you need to book out time for your personal life as well. So even if you run more than one calendar and put your bedtime in your calendar, you should have a bedtime uh, and put your time to go for your walk in the afternoon. And I found that's given me a little bit more structure in the way that I'm thinking between home and work, because for me, the two melt into each other. So just using that calendar concept, I thought was quite a clever idea to say, you know, on, on Wednesday evening at six o'clock, I'm cooking a nice meal for my family or whatever it might be. But yeah, that was just a bit of insight from my side. Very cool. Thanks, Nick. Shemaine, you've got your hand up. Hi ladies, yes, um, just to, to basically add what Lauren and Yvonne and, and Nick have said, um, you know, in the beginning it was obviously a lot of uncertainty and um, for those of you who know me, it's just me and my two daughters, but it's, um, um, and it's quite scary, you know, and because I've been out of the country for so long, especially and now coming back to big old scary South Africa, but it's, um, you know, we we what i what 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 is what we started doing is when my daughters train they swim a lot um sometimes i even have my pjs on when i drive all the way to the university with my tracksuit over and um i force myself i roll out of the car and i force myself to go run walk crawl whatever to get some fresh air in and appreciate what's going on around me and enjoy the sun rises and previously you know i would just sit in the car and grunt and and you know, wish her time in the pool over, but um, just starting to to appreciate little things like that. And I've even lost six kilos in the process, so yay. Um, and and then also we decided to to just live a, a healthier life altogether and, and you know, explored uh, vegetarian diets and it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So we challenge each other to 
to come up with um you know new recipes we take turns we we discuss it we we also don't watch a lot of tv but when we do i give you know everybody gets a turn every friday to choose something and we've got you know we discuss why we choose it and then afterwards you know what we got out of it and you know just just to get different conversation going um you know and um mm -hmm. yeah that's just my two cents worth so just trying i think it's all about bending your brains and 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 forcing you know getting yourself out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. that's very cool thanks Shah, for sharing anybody else got any comments what what are the experiments that you've done that maybe uh oh karika do you want to say first when i ask this question Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest thing is, I almost want to say, is just to, we, we, we're so used to get our energy from, you know, going out to nice restaurants or going away or to friends and family. I almost want to say, I think, you know, if you can get a hobby, you know, I must say, I think, you know, that really takes your, your focus off of other stuff. And if you really get something that you can immerse yourself in, um, I, I quite like nature and astronomy is now one of those things that I did as a kid and never got to around again. And um, now you've got the opportunity to, you know, do some research, go out at night, you know, and still almost would say be safe in this COVID era and still be able to learn new stuff, do certain things. And again, it's not possible for everything, but um, yeah, I, I would really recommend the hobbies. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, Karika, just to your point, um, and, and change of perspective is doing something different. Um, you know, I think doing something different is also really great for your brain. And so I know people um, who crochet or knit, or I took up um, sewing um, prior to lockdown, but have done quite a bit during lockdown. And I think doing something different to your daily grind is vital. I think that's really important. Yeah, and just building on that, what's really interesting is that when it comes to pleasure, we like novelty. Our brains seek out novelty. When it comes to pain, we seek consistency and to know what's up ahead. So we can deal with pain more easily if we just are more certain about what's going to, you know, what the order flows and what's going to happen. But for pleasure, we need to stimulate the brain, the brain with new things. So we know we can't control too much of the pain of knowing what the, what's happening in our in our context around the pandemic, but we know that we can control um, that variety in terms of seeking out new experiences. So all of these suggestions around hobbies, et cetera, are really, um, it's really, really important to keep your brain activated. Uh. I can see there's a comment here from Monique. She says, and you can make an entire algo <laughs> missing just watching them make those funkies in the lounge. Is that the pets? Monique? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it's definitely the pets. So um, I wanted to comment because Nikki um, adopted a dog and Charmaine also got a puppy. And um, I won't I won't split on Charmaine, but trust me, um, it's not just the swimming. She runs after her little puppet quite often. Um, and it's actually, I, I am involved in animal welfare, but it's very interesting to see how the numbers have gone up of people actually adopting and just finding joy and companionship. And like I said, I promise you that that irky thing, you can watch it for, for a significant amount of time. Um, and it's amazing how when you stumble upon your hobbies, you also stumble upon your people. I've actually made friends with, well, I don't know if, if it counts, but it feels like friends, you know, people with mutual interests that I've never met. Um, I tried to grow a plant from a from a little piece and just this propagation thing, you know, that's become a full blown hobby. And these people that I interact with regularly now that are from completely different walks of life I, and, you know, it, it enriches my life. It feels like a, a modern day pen pal sort of thing. Mm. And of course, that taps a little bit also into um, into this concept about um, kindness. Um, we know that um, kindness and doing things for other people helps uh, with people who are feeling melancholic and depressed. Um, so just reaching out and helping others is really good. 
Um, so especially in this long tunnel, you know, that concept of the long tunnel where the light is at the end and then just as you're starting to get to the light, there's and suddenly the tunnel just gets longer. <laughs> so um, this act of kindness and doing stuff for other people um, and animals, etc., is also really important to, to keep that sense of going, of moving forward in a positive and way. It's, and it's so super rewarding. I, I don't, we all think paying it forward, you know, it's a sacrifice. It isn't. It's such a blessing. Ask Nikki with her with her rescue dog. They just they give you insane amounts of joy. They love differently. So now I completely agree with you there. One hundred percent. Um, question around that integration of work and home as the future of work and how that works. Anybody have any comments on that? I'd be interested to hear your views on that because you know we tend to look at the future of um what what form and shape work will take and what skills we need to for the future. Natasha? Hi, Galen. Hello. Nice to see you. Have a pretty good long time. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Um, just something that we've experimented with is um, I can highly recommend a puzzle. Uh, we've got a hybrid walk workforce. So people that are working from home 50% of the time and then coming back into the office, we've got this puzzle and it's just lovely to create that form of engagement and looking for the missing pieces together, which is very symbolic of, you know, where we at as a company, as a as a continent or, you know, as a world planet. So, I mean, it's really, really working well. And um, there's a lots of collectivity, um, collaboration that's happening in the office and it's lots of fun. And it also helps us from a virtual fatigue um, perspective. So even if you're in the office, um, sometimes I just find myself moving towards the puzzle just to like switch the brain off a little bit and just get into a different space, you know, activating the different part of the brain. So that's something that we've tried and it really works well. We've just completed our first puzzle. It took us five months for 2000 pieces. It was huge. <laughs> so we're looking at the next one. So I can highly recommend it. Mm, that's awesome. Do you think you need to to have a love for puzzle building in order to do that? No, so it's interesting. Um, a couple of our staff members had never ever done a puzzle before. So there was a lot of learning that happened around it where we actually showed them in the beginning just to collect different colors and you know keep those colors together. And then those that, that could build the puzzle would use those pieces. And subsequently, those that had never built a puzzle we're loving the challenge. So it comes back to that whole thing of like stepping up and looking for the next challenge. Um, mm. And um, yeah, they did really, really well. So they're looking for us to purchase the next puzzle now. Oh, nice. I've got one for you. I've just completed the most impossible old world map puzzle. 1,500 mm. pieces, but I'm, I'm quite particular about my puzzles. So there's a structure, you know, you've got to put the border and then you've got to do this. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah. And it's and it's interesting to observe the way people build puzzles as well, and which elements that they they're more drawn towards. I mean, some people were drawn towards the animals, other towards the sky, others towards you know transformational objects like the butterfly. So it, and those, the last thing we built in the puzzle was the snake. So it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Thanks, Natasha. That's very very cool. <laughs> okay, cool. Other small experiments, things that you're doing, things that didn't work out so well that you tried. Nikki? Yeah, I think the whole um, dividing work and home. Sorry, I'm trying to get the camera going again. You know, switching off uh, from work to home. Uh, and again, I'm going to come back to the calendar. I'm going to start making a point of using that more regularly because it, that's a, something I found very difficult is home is always on from a work point of view now, more so than ever. We've all had email on our phones for years and um you know, access to laptops and that kind of thing. But 
in some of my home offices at the back of the house and that's a little bit easier because you can kind of close the door and walk out but in winter it's too cold to sit there so my office is in my bedroom and it's still a good office I've got a decent desk and I've got a nice chair and I've got my monitors but it, it's it's kind of very pervasive in my home and as you say your home life has fundamentally changed because of this work from home thing and it's really I struggle with setting the boundaries around that because my my child will come into my bedroom and he'll say mom it's it's home time and then I'm like well I just I just quickly want to finish this email because you can you can just quickly get the next thing out and then there's just quickly another thing um, and, you know, everything that we've seen in the research or any webinars you attend or whatever they're saying, you really do need to disconnect the two. But at the same time, I still find that extremely difficult. I mean, I've taken a week off now for no other reason than I can feel I'm running into a brick wall. It's just been too much. And Law sent me an email saying you haven't taken leave. But it, it's very difficult. So I think also working with your teams and telling each other that it's okay to switch off is important because it kind of almost gives you the permission to do it um, because you have to, you just, you have to switch off. But that's something I really struggle with. Mm. Yeah, I know we're seeing this a lot. And also, I guess from a, you know, if you're in a position of leadership, um, it's the walk, you know, uh, the, talk that you're walking you know it's what the kind of uh, practice that you're setting as an example or as a role model for other people in the organization so yeah, yeah um it's that always on culture always responsive or you know what are the rules around when it's okay to be contacted and when it's not and how do you define those for the rest of the people in your team by what you do easier said it's easy for me to sit here and say those but those are the kinds of things that will be really important in the future of work is what we uh, what we're modeling what we're doing and what we're modeling and where things need to be regulated and structured where things need to be free form and i think when the lockdown hit, it was kind of you know the uh, work went um remote um without being hybrid yet and there weren't as many rules and regulations and now we're finding that we need a few rules and regulations to set some ground rules so that people are not burning out yeah, especially because we are holding the fort over this longer tunnel. Um, yeah, anybody else want to share something that maybe is, has been a learning for them? Um, yeah, or a um, something that stretched them, something that's shifted because it stretched you, um, that may not have been, um, that may have been hard. I'm going to share something that I found working from home is um, because we're there, because I'm there all the time, little things that started to bother me that I wouldn't normally notice when I work from the office, like um, I'm talking about maintenance issues in, in and around my home, like my floors. I mean, I've got to be on a bonnet because I look at these floors every day now that I'm there and it, it bothered me and it irritated me. So. One weekend I got down on my knees and I started ripping my floors off. And after I've done about an area of, I, I guess about six by four, I'm thinking, oh crap, what have I done? Now I've got to get maintenance people in because I really can't finish the whole job myself. You know, but, but equally, it's not all bad because I learned to do other things myself that I normally would get maintenance people in to do, but I don't want strangers in my house for the fear of getting COVID and I don't know where they've been. So some good, some bad. Mm. Yeah, noticing different things when you're home all day. <clears throat> Anybody else? Karika? Um, just a quick comment again. <laughs> So um, if you go on to Microsoft Teams and on the left hand side, you've got the like three ellipses and um, you can click on that and then it gives you an option for more apps and then you can click on insights. And um, again, because so many people are working from home, uh, Microsoft has made available you know, certain things, about what they call like a virtual commute. So that at the end of the day, um, you can set, for example, how often hour before you would normally lock off work, your virtual commute will start and it will you know, start telling you to finish up certain tasks. Um, 
put your to-do list together for the next day and also have like um, coming now soon will be Headspace, will be integrated within Microsoft Teams. I'm not 100% sure if that's for free or if it's a paid version with Viva Insights. Is it Viva Insights? Uh, Viva, Viva something, I'm not quite sure. But for example, then that gives you the option to, you know, like you would normally pack up your stuff and leave your um, office, this will give you that virtual commute, which is, um, I've been trying to use it, uh, and it, I must say, it really makes a difference just to say that you know, you're done for the day. Mm. I think um, commuting, as much as people are loving not loving not the, uh, having the physical commuting, not sitting in traffic um, and having physical traffic time, I think that commuting break has been the biggest um, disruption to the balance between life and uh, in terms of work and personal life, because typically your commute on the way to work was kind of getting into work headspace, planning your day, planning what you knew was coming. You know, you kind of took that time, whether it was five minutes or 50 minutes to, to plan and, and get into the headspace. And on the way back, it's to get out of that headspace and kind of start thinking, what are you making for dinner? You know, and, and to Charmaine's point is run through like all the DIY that you must remember to prepare. Um, and that break, that bookends both ends of your day is now gone. And uh, so this virtual commuting, um, Karika, I think it's a fantastic idea because I do think that we need something. Like you can't just transition from one thing to the other. You know, closing your your home office door doesn't doesn't mean that your mind has changed and you're kind of now thinking about home, you know. So that that buffer is very, very important. Mom. Speaking of, of importance. Um, okay, I'm having a look at some of the other people that are on the call. I don't know, Vanessa, Vanessa Roth, if you are there and you want to add some comments. I think Van had to drop off Galen because she said she was presenting at five. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> oh, oh, Van, are you sorry? Yeah, actually, oh, there you are. Hello. I've got like 10 minutes, but it's such a, it really is such an interesting conversation. You know, I'm really enjoying it. So, you know, thanks for everyone who's commented. Uh, Galen, good to see you. Thanks for your presentation. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm presenting at the Women in Tech KZN chapter tonight, which is starting at, at half past five. But just something personally that I've been doing is I'm trying not to work on a Friday, which I know is quite like a, an ambitious task to do. Um, you know, it's 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 quite it's easier said than done. But what I've started doing it is in bite sized pieces. So I don't book any training on Friday. Um, I start Friday morning with an early morning, half past six to half past seven coaching call to um, a lady in California who I'm doing some talent sourcing coaching with. And then I try and keep the rest of the morning quite free just so I can catch up on my admin. So I try and finish by like one, two in the afternoon and then kind of call it a day and start the weekend early. We'll maybe try and go visit my folks or have a catch up with them or get out, do some shopping, just to like lighten the load on the weekend. Because my thinking is, is that we're going to work on the weekend anyway. I mean, I tend to work most weekends, but I don't mind that because it's quiet and I'm not in meetings and I haven't got people phoning me and I can get that thinking space of an hour or two or three where I can solidly focus on, you know, sourcing for my clients. So that's my thinking is that we don't have to be thinking in a traditional work week of a Monday to Friday anymore. Um, today I'm finishing a bit later. So myself and a friend at my complex went for a walk at eight until nine this morning and I started my day later. So I think what I'm trying to do is just trying to be kinder to myself. Um, I'm putting quite big gaps in between my training schedule to, to clients so that I can work on sourcing and, and and not finish last year with burnout like I did last year. So I think it's baby steps. I think we need to be careful, you know, with ourselves too. I know a lot of people are talking from a company perspective and managing teams, but it has to start with us. Uh, and that's what I'm consciously trying to do. Mm, awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah. that concept of, of um, it's almost the, cheers, the traditional, cheers. Working, checking, uh, traditional working week, you know, how that gets reshaped and remodeled based on what we what we prefer to do and what we want to do. Mm. One of the things that I've started to do is to block in deep work time. So for certain clients, I will block in an hour of time and that happens a certain time um, every day over the week. And then I don't do anything else in that time. So I don't check emails. Um, there's nothing else that I do apart from work that's relevant to that client. And it's amazing how I'm achieving so much more in the time that I'm allocating to them 
by focusing mm. just on them. And also when I do that, suddenly I realize how distracted I usually get, a phone call or an email or a, let me just do that or post this. or yeah. um, So you're concentrating. And, and- was and, and it, was, it was so true, Galen, what you were talking about multitasking. And, you know, it's, it's no secret. I, I really suffer from chronic debilitating ADHD. Like I'm on proper like, top dosage Ritalin um, for, for it. And, you know, it, it just actually doesn't work. You know, and I, I fought it for years and years. And now literally like echoing what Nikki said as well is I, I will block off of my diary between four and five if we're going for a walk. And then that's it. People can't book time with me. You know, I'm happy to talk to you when I, when I come back. But instead of trying to, you know, take a walk with the family and being on a Zoom call and it just doesn't work. So I'm really trying to segment different tasks at different times. And it's not all about, you know, getting loads of dollars in the bank or whatever it is. It's, it really is about, you know, um, keeping happy. And, and that's why I went to my own was to be happy. And I, and I don't think I honored that. If I'm completely honest, last year, I just was so petrified my business was going to close. So I just took on this year. I'm just thinking there's, there's, a, there's more to love. And, and Van, just to echo that point, I think what we must also remember is that people are watching you. So people yep. are observing your behavior and the example that you set or the behavior that you set. And and for new people coming into an organization or people, you know, um, attending to training with you and things like that, and they hear that you're like working until nine o'clock at night and start at five oh, in yeah. the morning, you know, it, it puts an, um, a, an immeasurable amount of pressure on people then to achieve. And we've got new people joining organizations. Everything is virtual. And the, then the impression they get is yep. flip, there's no downtime here, you know. So, um, it, for example, I will put into my calendar if, if my son is at home, like if my son is at home, please expect a delay. And it's a full, like an, a notification in my calendar. It's not blocked out, but just know if you're looking for me, you know, I might be having to put Finding Nemo on for the 12th time or like find a puzzle piece. <laughs> But what that has done is it's freed up other people in my organization to do the same. So instead of yep. feeling so, so nervous and stressed, because people are, everybody's so worried. And, um, you know, Yvonne raised the point earlier how difficult it is to build trust virtually with these new teams virtually. How yep. do you build t- trust? The same works for the new the people joining your organization. You know, they like fresh into this new environment um where do they go what do they do who do they ask for help it's not like in a in a bricks and mortar office where you could pop to the receptionist and go listen um you know who can i ask to help me with this and um so what example are they seeing what behaviors are they seeing and learning and how do how safe and and comfortable do they feel your hands um galen around like my child is sick and needs my attention more than something else. But I don't know how to communicate this without, like, I don't want my new company to think that I'm a lazy Netflix binging git sitting on the couch, you know, and actually I have these big concerns. So I think it's really important to be transparent with these small adjustments that you're making and share them you know, be open and share them, like, um, because it, it then gives people that impetus to also, you know, that 1% change and 1% change gradually becomes 5%, 10% and so on. Yeah. And and for me, I mean, one of the, the greatest lessons I learned, I mean, you know what, I th- actually think I learned of being a member of this woman in, in tech group is that when you run your own business, you're never going to be done. Like, seriously, you, I could sit and work here solidly for the next two months without sleeping, without getting up to go to the bathroom, and I probably still wouldn't be done with everything that I have planned. So for me, it's always like I'm, I very rarely work past five. I'm not going to lie. I, I'm not an evening person. I'd, I'd rather wake up earlier in the morning. But it's just like there's a time and a place, and Rome wasn't built in a day, and you just got to realize that. So on that note, I'm going to shoot to my next meeting. Thanks, Van. <laughs> But I did walk this morning, so I have had my balance. Good. <laughs> Good luck Cheers, with guys. the presentation. Hopefully Thanks, we can man. set up with that chapter too. Yeah, though they're cool. I've invited them to our chapter on LinkedIn. So I'll hook you guys up. Okay. Oh. Cheers. Bye. Bye.
So, um, Galen, what I would like... Oh, I see Natasha. Natasha, go ahead. Uh, just something from my point of view as a business owner, woman owner, uh, very much resonate with what Van was saying, what you were saying, Lauren and Galen, um, that you need to almost like lead by example. So there's a hell of a lot of pressure on you to be online 24-7. Um, so what's kind of worked in our organization, as I've said, it would be great if people could be online between 10 and 3 and then the hours before then or after them, um, it's up to their discretion as to when they're available and online. And it's been working quite well. Um, people feel like there's a sense of trust. We're not like double checking, you know, to see, you know, where are people, why aren't they online? So we have that kind of um, agreement within the team. And then also something that resonated was around, oh, sorry, I switched my phone off, was around self-kindness. And I think we're so hard on ourselves that we forget we're running around being kind to everybody else, but we're not being kind to self. Mm. And when I was sick over the past three weeks or so, um, I found it very difficult um, to have that self-kindness because you feel like you're letting the team down because you're not online and they're running around trying to support you. Um, and there's a beautiful... Um, Self-kindness is one of the elements of compassion. I'll actually see if I can find the link and you can do the test to test your self-kindness score. And it's amazing to see um, where your gaps are. And then those are the areas you can focus on. So that is something that, that, Natasha, uh, that's very important. Okay, I'll share it. Awesome. Um, Galen, so I'd like us to start wrapping up, if you don't mind. I did kind of promise that we'd give ladies time back based on, on the very fact that we know so many people have so much going on right now. Um, one thing I would just like to come back to is the quote that you opened your deck with and you said connection is not only good for bonding and for wellness, it is particularly useful when we feel many things to be outside of our control. Mm. Um, and so what I'd like to invite, and, and it will kind of start with you, please, is to carry on this conversation on a platform like LinkedIn. And, um, you know, to pose these questions that you've asked and um, let's engage, because I think there are a lot of people with a lot of information that might not feel comfortable talking um, in this forum. But um, if we if we can engage on LinkedIn and really create conversation around this, because I do think that especially that connection um, component. A lot of people feel very alone in all all aspects. Um, and just, just looking at the chat and seeing how much connection was done this evening, just talking about hobbies, um, commiserating about feeling guilty, taking me time, etc. We have so much in common. There's so much that we can do um, and share. So if you would please carry on the button and um, I will tag as many of these people that I'm connected to on LinkedIn and let's get that conversation going. And, and I think it's not so important to find a concrete answer as to have that discussion and get those ideas and thoughts out there. Yeah, 100%. And that's in, in fact how we prepare for the future. It's through thinking about it and discussing it and looking at what we're doing now and how we're responding and sharing tools and tips and what didn't work and what did. So yeah, 100%, because uh, it's Margaret Heffernan again, who says we can't, um, you know, we're used to just in time management and preparation and not just in case. And this discussion and the conversation is about preparing for the just in case, which we can't predict. So, yeah, 100%. I will do that. I'll post some questions and also some of the links to this work um, on hybridity, which might be interesting. Please do. I think it's been very insightful. Are there any questions for Galen before we wrap up today? Any comments or questions? Everybody getting ready to go climb into their pajamas. What do you mean climb into our pajamas? <laughs> We're already there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who, who's sitting in their onesies? <laughs> No, fantastic. Um, Galen, uh, really an incredible and thought-provoking session. 
Um, I think it's. Uh, I think you've really given us a lot to think about beyond just what we've discussed. Um, so the session, for those of you who didn't realize, the session is recorded. We will share the recording um, tomorrow on Facebook and LinkedIn. I have, if you scroll up in the chat, you can find those groups. Please join us. And as you've just heard, I've invited Galen to start a conversation with us on LinkedIn. And let's really, um, let's explore this further and share ideas. And, and those of you that are doing experiments in the workplace, please share that with us because we can only learn from each other and put those kind of things into practice. I love puzzles. My son loves puzzles now, which is really exciting and it's great to see. And so um, for my colleagues on this call, we are definitely doing the, the puzzle thing um, as Natasha suggested. I think that's a great idea. Um, but beyond that, I think it's been a really insightful session. So thank you very much to you and to Karika for all the insights about Google. Um, and ladies, please just stay safe. Most importantly, stay at home um, and, and just keep exploring new ways of, of, of the traditional. So um, Yvonne, there's your homework. You're going to have to find some new topics or new things to do I with your paint family. By numbers. I've bought paint by numbers, so I will there let you go. guys know how that goes. There we go. <laughs> Mary, Mary, for 19 years and resorting to paint by numbers to have a conversation. Um, no, listen, it's a, it's, a, it's a real issue. So really share these kind of things and give your feedback. And really, Galen, thank you for establishing this conversation, talking about the future of work. It's the future of, of everything, actually. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Galen. That was amazing. Mm, pleasure. Thanks, Yvonne. Have a great evening, everybody, and chat soon. Thanks, Lou. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. 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 Thanks, Lou.